Well, my day job, I'm a realtor with Sotheby's International, but one of my true passions is reading and moderating this fabulous event that Sharon Watkins, the owner of Chasey Bistro, and I started in 2016. So thank you all for braving the weather and coming out to be with us this evening. What we do is we invite local authors to come and share their experience and tell us about their books. And today we have Donna Marie Miller, who has written this fabulous book about the growth we spoke. And she has a couple of guests, which of course we have Mr. James White here, and our performer, uh, Ben Stafford Rogers. <laughs> She originally was born in Yankee, but her family finally settled down in El Paso. She went to the University of West Texas a which is West Texas A&M, and after she graduated from West Texas A&M, um, she uh, got jobs as a reporter. Uh, she went on to get a, her master's degree in creative writing. And she also taught school for many years. And she finally moved here with her family, uh, or with her husband, and started a family in the 90s. So we'll, we'll, we'll consider you an Austin <laughs> <laughs> um, And I want to tell you a little bit about Mr. White. He, with his wife, Annette, not Annette. Annette, Annette, Annette start, uh, opened the Broken Spoke in 1964. So, <laughs> it has an incredible history and it, with unbelievable stories which Donna Marie has captured in her book. And we're going to get to a lot of those stories. You know, we'll, we'll have to just hit the highlights because, you know, there's hundreds of pages full of amazing stories. So Donna, why don't we start with you, and I'd like to talk about how did you get the idea for this book, and tell us about your collaboration with not only Mr. White, but with um, your other sources. Okay, well, in uh, 2013, I was finishing up my 24th year of teaching at Bowie High School in Austin here, and one of the students in my classroom was Mr. White's granddaughter. Her name is Molly Jo Montague, and her assignment, like all of the other journalism students, was to create a documentary about someone that they really was, were close to. And she wanted to write about her grandfather, and so she asked me if I would go and help her with that. So I went with her, and I had been to the Broken Spoke many, many times since 1982, but I had never had a really good conversation with Mr. White. He always greets people at the door when you come in in his, his wonderful bling shirts and cowboy hats, but we had never had a conversation. And so we really hit it off that day when she was filming the documentary. I got to meet her mom, who is Mr. White's grand, uh, daughter, Terry White, and she teaches dance lessons at the Broken Spoke. So we interviewed both of them for the documentary that she did. And at the end of the afternoon, I, Mr. White said, you know, I've always wanted a book about this place. Oh. And I said, I can do that for you. I'm going to be unemployed in about two weeks. <laughs> so that's she, what she did. Didn't, she didn't get fired, but she quit. <laughs> yeah, she retired <laughs> from teaching and went back to writing. And uh, so once a week, sometimes twice a week, I would go up to the Broken Spoke or to the White family home or the ranch and interview him and I would record those interviews and take them home and transcribe them and he would look over them and then I'd add them to the book. And that's how I did with a lot of the performers. I interviewed 110 musicians and dancers and people that were fans of the Broken Spoke going back 30, 40 years and did the same thing. They approved all of those transcripted interviews and put them in the book. And it's just been a joy from day one, just a wonderful joy. The White family is my family now. I feel, I feel there are a lot of people reading this and hearing the stories of the musicians. They, they feel that. They have an instant or a, a deep connection with the White family. 
And I just, just to give you guys just a sense of who all has performed at the Broken Spoke. We're going to kind of go through it. But I thought it would be fun if you two kind of would just give us, you know, a list off the top of your head of who all has, has played at the Broken Spoke. Who's good at that? That's a real long list. It's long list. <laughs> anyway, it's been my pleasure uh, to book uh, an honor to book all the big stars and all the local musicians and just uh, the musicians coming in. And I've met, that's where I met Ben Rogers right there at the Broken Spoke. And uh, he plays out there and plays, uh, been playing for him quite a while. And, uh, anyway, I, I book all the bands, but some of the bands, when I get up on the stage to introduce the band, I always make a big deal out of it. And, I call it my BS speech, and in a way it is kind of a BS speech, whether if that stands for something else or if it stands for broken spoke. Uh, anyway, I, I get up there and I say, we've had people like Bob Wheel right here. We've had Willie Nelson, George Strait, Dolly Parton, Ernest Tubb, Jack Schmitter, Roy Hickup, the list goes on and on and on, but I'm very proud, you know, about the best thing that happened to me, and I'll, usually I'll start out by introducing the band, and. I got the first one I kind of did, my, what I call my BS spill, was with Alvin Crow. I've been booking Alvin Crow uh, since 1973. And he's the one that kind of gave me whatever it takes to get up there and sing a song with a band and get up on the stage. And, and I've traveled with him to a lot of places. And I've been to a lot of places myself. And it's, a, it's an honor. I, I always remember when I first got up there and sang with Alvin Crow. But anyway, I come with, on his introduction, I always say, you know, about the best thing ever happened a short time back, there's a young man from the Panhandle, he put his fiddle on his arm, he told his mom and daddy, I'm going to come to Austin, Texas, I'm going to play music at the Broken Spoke, let's make him welcome, singer, songwriter, recording star, Alvin Crow with the President of Valley Mall. <laughs> <laughs> After that, we jump into a song that I wrote about the Broken Spoke. It's called The Broken Spoke Legend. And I've had a lot of things to do with that song all over. And it's the first song I ever wrote in my life. And uh, I used to be back in our kitchen at the end of the night. We had a big hailstorm way back there in, uh, I think, the 80s. It kind of wiped out my office, and I never did get around to fixing it back. Like, you now it's kind of like a storeroom. Anyway, I'll set up with all the bands in the kitchen, no matter who it is, you know. They go back in the kitchen, I'll set it up. We're back here BSing and talking, and of course there's some drinking going on also. But why not? It's a beer joint, it's a honky tonk. <laughs> anyway, so I'm back here with Alvin, and my wife said, well, why don't you uh, sing him that song you wrote about the broken spoke? It's a waltz tune. And so I sang him a few verses, and he said, well, why don't you uh, write one more verse? And then uh, I'll record it. And so I thought it took me a long time to think up a verse to any song, you know. So anyway, one night I came out about two in the morning and I took a look out there and I said, well, hell, this is just a red rusty gold building with a dirt parking lot and there's a big old oak tree by the highway. It means quite a lot. So that was my last verse. And so I finished my song. <laughs> the words come to you when you least expect them. But anyway, it's um, I owe that all to Alvin Crow, and we did a lot of stuff together, and uh, we toured together, went all the way to D.C. with him, and uh, Oklahoma, and uh, a lot of a lot of different cities. But he's uh, kind of the backbone. And one night, Alvin Crow called me up in 1975, and he said, "You know, I'm gonna be a little bit late tonight, uh, but I've got a wedding to play, but I got a good little band." from San Marcos is going to open up for me. And uh, the name of the band was Ace in the Hole, and the lead singer was George Strait. <laughs> and so that's the first time I put George Strait at the Broken Spoke. And uh, I liked him very well. Great singer, still is. I booked him from 75 to 1982. And when he worked for me out there, he was making, you know, three, four, five hundred bucks a night. And then all of a sudden he came out with a song called Unwound. And I know his drummer, Tom Foote, who's also his stage manager, manager today, he came and said, well, you know, Torres is up in Nashville recording. And I'm thinking, you know, I've heard that a lot. You know, everybody goes to Nashville and they record. You never hear that much more about it. But 
Anyway, the majority hit it big, big time song. Anyway, then he jumped up to, I think, 3,500. I booked him a couple times after that. Then he jumped up to 20,000. <laughs> then I had to think about that. <laughs> and that kind of got my attention, but before I could decide, he had already got up to 100,000. So I thought, you know, I, I, I don't want to go bankrupt Bucking George Strait, but he is a good guy, and I, all the success in the world to him, and a lot of his musicians, they still come out there, and he still gets me tickets to concerts if I want to go, and so I appreciate that. And he usually always mentions the spoke as one of his starting places in the music business. But that was a, one of the things, and a lot of people, they ask me, so well, how did you come up with the name Broken Spoke? And I was in the United States Army. I was getting to be a short time, and I didn't know what I was going to do when I got out. And I was from Austin, Texas. I was born and bred in Austin, Texas. And I went to school there. I got married here. But, you know, marriage came later. But, you know, at the time, I was single. I was in the United States Army at Fort, Fort Sam Houston. And I was thinking about what I was going to do. And I thought, you know, I like to kind of, my parents would take me to places similar to the Broken Spoke when I was growing up. And so I thought, you know, it'd be kind of neat if I could open up a place of my own. Because I always had fun there and all the different bars in Austin and all the different dance halls. And uh, everybody always treated me real good. And I had a good time. So I thought it'd really be something if I could open up a place of my own. And I didn't have that much money, but I had the willingness to, to work and I had good credit. And so I thought, you know, I'm, I'm, I got to think of a name from a bar. And so I thought of all the Western names and all the something country, something Texas. I wanted something original. And I had wagon wheels kind of going around my brain. And all of a sudden, kind of a light bulb came off and I got thinking about a wagon wheel. And then I thought about an old uh, movie with uh, Jimmy Stewart called Broken Arrow. And I said, well, you know, I miss it. Give me a couple of wagon wheels and I'm going to knock a spoke out. I put one in front and decided to come inside the broken spoke and I'll name it the broken spoke. So I, I never really looked back after that time and I came underneath the big old oak tree on South Lamar and I visualized a place like no other and when I got it built I named it the broken spoke. Wow. <laughs> structure her book it's set uh, by decades it's segmented by decades and um, so I'd like to talk a little bit first about the 60s and 70s specifically about the influences of Bob Wills and, and Willie Nelson and kind of uh, I'd like to there's a picture of Willie Nelson in here and I, I tagged it because you can't even believe it's the same person. I mean, he's wearing a white turtleneck and he's short hair. But as you can see, his, his eyes are exactly the same. So tell us about booking Willie and having Bob Wills. Well, you know, I'm, Willie, he's one of a kind now. Everybody knows him as a super at the top of the line, you can get to be an icon, I guess they say. And, you know, he's more than that, you know. But Willie really hasn't changed any since the days in the 60s. I first booked him in 1967. He was clean shaven, short hair, wore a sports coat, and then he wore a vest, maybe a turtleneck sweater. And uh, he had a song out called uh, Mr. Record Man. Something about it's your record man, I'm looking for a song I heard today, that kind of thing. And so it just kind of flows through because Willie used to be a DJ years ago. And you ought to hear his spiel he used to do about, I don't know, stump jumping, frog gigging or what. He goes on and on and on. And so then he used to tell what county he's from. But that was the start of his radio show. But anyway, he was very good to me and always has been. And uh, I even booked his daddy, Bob Nelson. <coughs> I booked him, Willie Nelson, first time, 1967, for 800 bucks a night. And then today, I haven't really paid Willie Nelson anything for playing at the Rope and Spoke for the last 
30 years. I mean, he just comes out even when he was $10,000 a night, which was years ago. I used to book Pop Nelson and uh, Jesse Ashlock, who was Bob Will's first Western takeoff fiddle player. And that, that was their band, but when Willie was in town, he'd come out and play all night for nothing. And so that's just the way he did it, you know. He'd wear them out. He didn't take no breaks. When he got up there, he stayed, you know. And today he gives everybody their money's work, and he'll give everybody autographs and talk to them, just like he did back in the 60s. And I guess I don't get to see him as much as I used to, but um, I still get to see him. And he does come out to the Broken Spoke, and he's bought a lot of TV shows after the Broken Spoke, and he's always promoted it. And uh, I think he always will. And uh, that's what they're good friends, that's what they call him, Will. You know, if you're a good friend of Will, you say Will. You know. <laughs> anyway, I, I still prefer calling him Willie. Now, Robert have all been out to Broken Spoke so many times that he says, call me Bobby. And it's kind of hard for me to call Robert of all Bobby of all. <laughs> that's, that's what he likes, you know. <laughs> but anyway, um, but going back to Willie, he just did a lot of stuff, and he still comes to Broken Spoke. And way back about 1990, Willie was having a tax problem. He only owed about sixteen and a half million dollars, <laughs> and I figured that uh, I didn't really have sixteen million to give him, but I was going to kind of help him raise some money to pay the IRS because I was kind of upset with the IRS for going to his house and taking his house and taking all his gold records, taking his pictures off the wall. And uh, anyway, so I told my wife uh, one day we was hearing about it on the radio, and I said, well, I'm going to get a, a gallon deal pickle jar, and I'm going to put it on the bar at the Broken Spoke. And I put on there, where there's a Willie, there's a way. And if people like Willie Nelson, they'd drop some money in this deal pickle jar. Anyway, Associated Press, um, they got wind of it, they came out and said, would you hold this bill pickle jar in front of the spoke? And so I did. And then he said, do you mind if I do this Associated Press? And that meant the whole world knew about it. And so we, I started getting calls from everybody. And uh, they wanted to get in on the Willie thing. They wanted to hear the story. And they would, I would give interviews at 2 in the morning to some of these guys that had all night radio shows. And, I had like CNN on the line, I had Paramount on whole Fox News, and it was a busy time, but I was kind of, I told Willie, I said, I feel like your mailman. <laughs> I started getting letters all over the world addressed to Willie Nelson, and some of them, and they all had money in them. And every one of them, they had a good thing to say about Willie Nelson. And some of them was like from, one of them was from the Birmingham jail, a prison. <laughs> Send your money to help Willie. And some of them was from Desert Storm, Desert Chill. And then uh, I would read every letter, and then I'd give him a letter and a check when I seen him. But anyway, that one of them was from, um, it's, uh, several from an Indian reservation. I remember one of them, they said, well, you know, me and Mama, we ain't got much, but uh, you're welcome to stay here at the teepee with it, on the reservation, and you're, you can have an old truck drive around. But anyway, it's just, and so Willie came back, and no, before he came back, he was in the wire. That's one of the reasons why I wanted to make him some money, because he was stuck in the wire. And we needed him back in Austin, Texas. And so we had a fundraiser dance, and we sent him a bunch of money. Willie don't ever want me to tell how much money it was, but I sent it over there. At the time, he thought the IRS had his phone book. <laughs> anyway, he, I sent it over there, and he, he called me up at my house. And he said, James, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart, and I appreciate what you've done, and I received the package that you sent. That's what he said. He didn't say nothing about the money. And then he said, I'll be home for Christmas, and after Christmas, I'm gonna come to Broken Spoke. I'm gonna do a little picking. I'm gonna eat a chicken fried steak, drink a cold beer, and I'm gonna bring some of my friends with me. And that's when he brought Chris Christopherson, and then all the locals, they all came out. And it was a big night. It was, I'll, I'll always remember it. And it was just his way of saying 
thanks for helping me. And um, he did tell me his wife, he, she said, Andy at the time, still is, and she says, uh, do you have any long sleeves t-shirts? It, it's January and it was cold. And she said, I already took everything we own. And so I got some sweatshirts for him. <laughs> anyway, it's, uh, he finally went from here. He went up to Branson. He played all them shows up for about six months. He got everything paid off to, enough to satisfy them. So now he's in the clear. And he got most of that property back, you know. They never took his home in Hawaii because they owed too much money on it. <laughs> they let him keep that one. <laughs> Everything else he had to buy it back. <laughs> All right, well, let's, so, so we have, you know, in the honky-tonks of the 40s and 50s were very Western. And so now let's progress to the 60s, 70s. And I'd like to ask Donna, um, it turns out, I learned from Donna's book, that the term progressive country was originated by two disc jockeys here in Austin, mm -hmm. specifically for the sound that was coming out of Austin. <coughs> so I'd like for you to tell us about the Broken Spokes role in Austin's progressive country scene and, um, and how, and then there's a great quote by Joe Nick Potosky in this, in this book and it says, I'm sure you all know who that is. He says, one big difference about Austin's hippies compared to the hippies everywhere is that they like beer and country music. <laughs> so I want you to tell us how the Broken Spoke helped bridge those two cultures. In, in 1973, Congress changed the drinking age. You probably remember that. And it changed the face of Austin, it really did. It put a honky-tonk or a bar or a dance hall on every corner here in town. And the bands were playing all the time, as soon as the sun went down, until late into the night. And you know, there were these two disc jockeys, Rusty Bell and Joe Gracie, working for Coke FM. And they coined the term progressive country because the cowboys and the, the um, hippies were coming together in one place. And some dispute whether it started at the Broken Spoke or whether it started at the Split Rail or whether it started at the Armadillo World Headquarters. But no one can dispute that when Congressman uh, Lloyd Doggett held his fundraiser at the Broken Spoke in July of 1973 and hired Marsha Ball, a.k.a. Freedom the Fire Dogs, to perform, <laughs> it changed everything. Those that came, and there were 500 people that came to that fundraiser, will never forget that the cowboys and the hippies came together under one roof, and they listened to the same music by Freedom the Fire Dogs, and they drank the same beer, and they <laughs> had a wonderful time. And Mr. White took note. It changed the way that he began to look at the type of music, the type of bands that would start playing in the Broken Spoke. And may I ask him if he would like to add to that? Sure. Go ahead, Mr. Anyway, 1973 was a big year. That's the first year I booked um, Freedom Fire Dogs, and I booked uh, Alvin Crow and Pleasant Valley Boy, and I booked um, Asleep at the Wheel. It all happened that same year. But I, I always got a kick out of it. You know, I've always been kind of a, you know, a, I don't know if you call me a redneck or not, but I mean, I'm just no country boy from South Austin. And uh, but I've always had short hair and never had a beard. But anyway, back in those days, I mean, we'd, we'd watch all the hippies come in and we, we, we got kind of a kick out of watching them. But you know, I, I, I got to figure, you know, they don't ever call, they didn't cause any trouble. Sometimes them cowboys cause some trouble. Especially <laughs> <laughs> bull riders. I mean, one, one of my ex son in laws was a bull rider. I know all about the bull riders. But anyway, they used to come out there and they didn't know how to dance the hippies. And I used to, I, I know they come out in those little hippie vans and those weird looking cars, and they always dress a lot different from what we dress like. You know, the overall, they started coming out and, you know, barefoot. They just come out barefoot, and they would dance something that looks like a, like a hoedown, but we kind of coined it the, the hippie hop. <laughs> but but they, uh, they would dance real fast, you know. <laughs> But it, it, it was a lot of fun back in them years, and uh, I'll always remember it, and 
I just figured that if she could draw that much, you know, uh, it's hard to draw a lot of people on a fundraiser, but when she drew like 500 people, and um, I figured I'm, I'm going to start booking this band, and that's when I started booking her. And she went all the way from uh, Fleet of the Fire Dogs to Marsha and the Mendoza Brothers, Marsha and the Misery Brothers, now it's just plain Marsha Ball, and she's, uh, she lives fairly close to my house in South Austin, and she's been there a long time, and uh, we've always got along. She's in the, in the book, and she's also in her movie, you know. Okay, so that's kind of the, we'll race through the 70s. Now let's talk about the 80s, because the 80s were a big time. In the 80, 80s, you had the movie The Urban Cowboy, you had the TV show Dallas, and you also had To Austin, South by Southwest. So uh, tell, tell us a little bit about the 80s and how that changed life at the Broken Spoke. The Texas legislature um, changed the drinking age back to 21, and Mr. White had to think of new and inventive ways to get people to come in during the weekdays and perform. And he started a band calendar, and he started uh, Nickel Beer Night. Ten, ten cent ten, but you also went to Nickel for a while. The problem with the Ten Cent Beer Night was that they couldn't some of the people in the um, bar area who worked at the Broken Spoke would imbibe a little bit. They'd drink a little bit, and they couldn't keep track of the number of draft beers that they had sold, so he was losing money at that. But um, he said, you know, I've got to do something. So he had a belly dancers convention. That's Broken Spoke. But the people really came to that, and they really enjoyed the pre-show because they built a little curtain as the side show for the girls to dress behind, but there was a light behind that silhouetted oh, them. God. <laughs> and uh, so they really enjoyed that better than the, the dancing. Same, same like a bed sheet. <laughs> <laughs> then we we also had a um, fight club night, right? They, on Tuesday, uh, Tuesday, nights. Tuesday nights. Tuesday nights they would build a ring in the middle of the dance floor, and they, the ropes got kind of floppy. They didn't stand up pretty good. They <laughs> had used sandbags to hold them up, and they would transport all the fighters from downtown at a gym downtown to come fight all different categories of fighters, lightweights to full weights. But um, Mr. White had a no uppercuts policy. He'll tell you why. Yeah, you know, this one, I, I used to bartend about 16 hours a day, but uh, anyway, back when, maybe in the 80s, I wasn't really bartending 16 hours, but him and him, uh, I, to me, I thought maybe he was a punch drunk fighter, you know, because he said, he kept saying, yeah, I fought the champ one time, and he started talking about his fighting career, and all oh, I love him, oh, Connor pose, man, I love this, and all of a sudden he said, well, why don't you uh, have some fights out here on Tuesday night? I know the guy that runs Pan Am Gym, you know, we'll get all the boxers to come out here, it won't cost you nothing. You can sell a lot of beer. So anyway, but those fighters, it was, they started out about this tall, and they would be, at the end of the night, they'd be like 200 pounders. But um, because of our low ceiling, we could not have uppercuts loud. That's what it was called. It did not hold in the ceiling. But, <laughs> but anyway, it was fun, and, but it was just so much work. I mean, our, we never could ever get the ropes tight enough. And, and the, all the plywood, a lot of work, cinder blocks, plywood, roping, wrap the rope, hit the turnbuckles. We even had a little dinging bell <laughs> round the wall. But anyway, it, a lot of people, they still, um, I think uh, the debaters, they like the, the fight nights, I think. They, they like me talking about that. But anyway, that was, was a good time. But actually, I think it was, we just had 10 cent bottle beer at first, and but we would limit it to, uh, I think Lone Star Pearl, Falstaff, and Jacks, and all other beer was regular price. And then later on, we went to Nickel Beer, just on draft beer. But then we charged a cover, it's very complicated. We charged a cover charge, then the band will want so much money, then if I made so much on that, then I have to subtract the cost of the beer. The band was people's choice. Do y'all remember the people's choice? It was one of our biggest, Drawing band, mm -hmm. especially like on uh, the night before 
Thanksgiving. I mean, it'd be like 600 kids out there, and they uh, they always they, those guys are like 60 years old today. And the lead singer, his name was Stacy, and I used to kid him because he was like about 50 years old at the time. And I said, "You got to start drawing some older people that drink beer, you know." And I said, "They're over there teaching at Zilby Elementary right now. They got they put on the chalkboard." His name was Stacy Poole. Yeah. They put Mama, Daddy, and Stacy. They, they put your name because all your customers was in that class. <laughs> and did the, the, because of Urban Cowboy and that, did kind of people who didn't two-step or didn't know how to two-step start showing up and, and wanting to be a part of a honky-tonk? It, it opened people's eyes to kind of that I love, I love that movie. That's a classic movie, and uh, we got to meet uh, those people in that movie, and uh, we got to meet all the people that was on Dallas TV show, and uh, I could have been in the Urban Cowboy because my daughter was, it's kind of like, it ain't what you know, it's who you know. She was dating this <laughs> Ranger's son, so we all went up to South Park, and I drank with, with uh, J.R. Ewing and all of that <laughs> night. I mean, he should look champagne and got a big bottle. And we watched him do a, 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 a one take of, a, of a, a scene in the movie. I'm the movie in Dallas. But in that night, we all went to Mesquite to the rodeo. And so I stood by J.R. all that night. He was a very nice guy. And I met the whole cast. Anyway, my daughter's. Uh, Barfin's father, he was dating the casting director of the Urban Cowboy. And she told me, she said, I'm the casting director, why don't y'all come down, I'm gonna do a little, a new movie called Urban Cowboy. And at the time, I had to get back to the spoke, so I missed out on that movie, but anyway, uh, John Travolta did come to the Broken Spoke. His bodyguard brought him out there when he was uh, filming the urban cowboy and he did his i mean it was in the daytime he came out just be him and his bodyguard in the back and he did his back up the bar and his arms out got <laughs> serving and everything you know <laughs> anyway he was very very nice to me i heard later on that he got in trouble with some news guy downtown in austin because <laughs> they was trying to hurry him along on something he didn't want to get hurried along <laughs> but anyway we we've had a lot of movie stars, I mean, I would have never got to meet all these people. I mean, we've had people from all the world come there and uh, over the years, but at first it was just a neighborhood bar. I was a country Cheers. I never watched the show Cheers, although I was working for one thing, and I was living the country cheer life, because I knew everybody came out there. I knew all their kids, I knew, you know, what where they worked at. And now we just get so many people, like I have them, a whole big group from France the other night, and a whole big group from Australia, and they just every night there are different countries that come out there. And we are on the, um, the um, tour guide of, of Europe, and we're on the bucket list in Australia. <laughs> <laughs> I had a guy from, they, from Belgium come in. He said, well, our tour guide told me to Go to the Capitol, go see a Longhorn, go to the Broken Spoke. He said, hell, he said, you can't drink or dance in the Capitol, I just came to the Capitol. <laughs> well, Donnie, in your book, you say that the 90s were actually the heydays, and we've already alluded to part of why, it's because basically Mr. White rescued Willie Nelson from being stuck in Hawaii and the whole world knew about it. He ended up on three national magazines including Entertainment Weekly. Um, but you also started the a Broken Spoke series at the Performing Arts Center at UT. And that and then that, that was a good friend Pebbles Wadsworth. Very nice lady. I don't know if y'all know Pebbles or not, but um, she told me I could do anything I wanted to. If I take a show to the Bass Concert Hall, and so I said, "Well, why don't you to go over there?" And she said, "We need you to help the University of Texas." I said, "I want you to go tell my wife that you need my help because she ain't gonna believe it if I tell you." <laughs> 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 but anyway, 
actually one of my first big stars at the concert was Willie Nelson. And I, I, I tried to match it up. I did several series over there. And I booked Jersey up there. I booked Sleep the Whale, the Geese and Slaws, uh, Alvin Crow, uh, Gary P. Nunn, Jimmy Dale Gilmore, just a whole bunch of people that played. Oh, Chris Wall, he was there. And uh, a, lot, a lot of the old Texas Playboys came out. Mm -hmm. Well, also in the 90s, in addition to doing all of that, you also had a movie that filmed there with Dolly Parton and Ray Benson called Texas Wild Wind. And wait till you all see this picture. Okay, there's some great photos of you, but the one of you... I was married to the one Texas Wild Okay, but the one of you with Dolly Parton, I mean, take a look at that, Chris. I mean, you're, just, you're just so happy. And... Um, so that's a true. I didn't pick your picture. I remember it well. <laughs> I was in the very first scene of that movie, and the director liked me. So they said, well, you know, we have a small speaking part for you if you want it. So I said, well, sure, you know. And so I, I had to wait a long time to take that. But anyway, I was back there drinking peppermint snops in between the takes, and then somebody came up to me and said, well, are you supposed to drink when you're in the movies? And I was oh hell yeah, you do that all the time. You know? so, like, like I know all about being in the movies. <laughs> but I was a star for the afternoon. I had a star on my dressing room, had my name on it. And uh, I never did really use my dressing room. I think the director liked my vest, liked my hat. So that, that was in. I was in like Flynn. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm going to have to go watch it now. But anyway, you, have, you know, you have a role there. I told so the very first scene. Anyway, um, Dolly was there, and I wanted to get a picture. And that's the reason I got to get the picture, because the producer you know, brought her over there. And because she was there, but she had security, and then she had more security. But then after we met and everything, it was every time, wherever she filmed in Austin, I was, uh, I could go back and, and talk to them and visit them, because I was in the movie. But anyway, on this one, I was standing by Dolly, and the photographer was messing around the camera, and he's telling about all the pictures he's taken and all. And anyway, I told him, I said, just take all the time you want. And Dolly <laughs> was bouncing up and hugging me, and she's and laughing and cutting up, and that's what she does. She's very fun to do a movie with, because she jokes with all the audience and all the extras. And it makes it a lot more fun. And I can say that Dolly Parton sang at the Broken Spoke. Because she sang and her backup band in the movie also was asleep at the wheel. Wow. Oh. And didn't that cause some problem? Because of course Ray Benson is so tall <laughs> so and Dolly Parton is very small. So she like had to stand on something and he had to like yeah. like y'all had to Tell us how that works. He couldn't well, I'll tell, you, I'll tell you what, the, the movie is called Wild Texas Nights or Wild Texas Wind. Wind. But mm -hmm. anyway, the original script, it was called Big T. <laughs> because Dolly's name was Thelma Lynn and Ray Benson's name was Ben Racer. And he was big tall, but just for the heck of it. They said, well, they're Big T. So she's just sharp. And Dolly never did really catch on to it. But NBC, they said, we are not showing any film <laughs> on national TV with Dolly Parton called Big T. <laughs> 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 so they had to change the name. <laughs> and, and Dolly never did figure out why. <laughs> she didn't get it. <laughs> And then, of course, you had Kinky Friedman, which, who I think is so poetic. And um, I uh, had a quote in here I wanted to. Uh, but but tell that. us a little bit about the Dixie Chicks and the whatever we call the 2000s. The oh, Oz. The Oz. The Oz. Okay. No, I like the Dixie Chicks. They did a good job when it's out there. And uh, I did do a TV thing with Natalie Maines in my Cadillac, my 54 Cadillac Coupe de Ville. Mm -hmm. And the scene was 
we're going to be driving up and down the moor, and I'm supposed to talk about places, points of interest. And uh, so I was doing all that, and the camera crew was in the back seat, and they said, well, uh, I think Natalie wants to drive this car. Oh. And I said, you know, I used to live out right over here. <laughs> and I said, I went to school down the road here, and I just changed the subject because I figured Natalie might have a heavy foot on my poor old classic <laughs> Cadillac. <laughs> The thing is, it's not that easy to drive. It's a huge steering wheel, got a lot of play in it, and sometimes you got to pump the brakes. But still, it's still, a, I think, the coolest car in town. <laughs> and then Kinky Friedman was there a lot, and he has a great quote. He says that, and, and we haven't talked a lot about this, but part of you know what makes the Broken Spoke so special is its authenticity and its resistance to change, but you also embrace, you know, like the hippies and, you know, Dixie Chicks, and so you're not completely opposed to new things, but Kinky Freeman says that it's, it's been a fixed point in a changing world, and I just really appreciate the way he's, he said that, and he was <coughs> there a lot during the, that, that decade. And then, Donna, tell us a little about the 2010s. We've got three generations uh, <coughs> running the Broken Spoke, and of course we have new neighbors, and we have two documentaries. So tell us a little bit about that. Okay, well, I, I do want to mention, too, that in 2001, the landowner mm -hmm. of the land <coughs> surrounding the Broken Spoke and beneath it, Jay Johnson, who used to be a city councilman here in Austin, passed away. And his family began to look for people to buy the land, and they wanted to make sure to keep the Broken Spoke intact. Mm -hmm. And first it sold to Riverside Resources, then to Transwestern Developers, and now it's owned by CW Partners. But Transwestern was the ones that built the apartments around it that kind of gave it the look of the Stuart Little House with the <laughs> Broken Spoke squeeze between. <laughs> yeah. um, and during that time, it was so stressful that a lot of health issues popped up. Um, uh, James White developed a, a heart problem, um, and Mrs. White had breast cancer, so she's a survivor. So going into the 2010s, it was, it was a new time, and they were looking forward to the future because they had made it through all of the construction and survived on, on, on South Lamar. And in, t in 2010, um, we had both daughters, Ginny White and um, Terry White. They had children, and, and Mr. White also has grandchildren and great-grandchildren. But they were all working at the Broken Spoke. The daughters, Mrs. White, Mr. White, um, Ginny's husband, uh, Mike was working there, Mike Peacock. And, and they also have some employees that have been with them for a while. So they were all working hard to keep the Broken Spoke going, and Mr. White began to really look at it as a win-win, thinking that these new people moving into the apartments next to the Broken Spoke might become patrons of the Broken Spoke. So they would have happy hours, and they would come over and go dancing, and he would just embrace them, you know, like family, come on in. So they, they, they saw it as a situation where they were living next to the hippest place in town. You know, this is the Broken Spoke. And the, the great thing is, is that Brenda Mitchell, who owns um, Wild, um, Wild Blue Yonder Films, mm -hmm. also was a patron of the Broken Spoke, and she started a documentary that's now out. Um, it's called Honky Tonk Heaven, The Legend of the Broken Spoke, and it showed just last week at the Elmo Draft House. Um, it also won the um, Audience Award in 2016 at South by Southwest. Mm -hmm. And I was working on my book, and we collaborated on a couple of interviews. Um, we conducted the interviews together, and then they filmed. And so it was a new time. There were, there were new people in the White family, grandchildren and great-grandchildren. There were these wonderful things happening to get the word out that the Broken Spoke has been around for 50 years, right? Now it's 53 this November. And people all over the world began to really hear about the Broken Spoke in new ways. Um, we, 
we began to realize that all around the world, because on Saturdays when you go there, people will sometimes tell the band members where they're from, and they'll say Romania, or I heard about, <laughs> I'm not kidding, Romania. They'll say, we're from Romania, we heard about the broken skull. And, and Slovenia, too. Slovenia. <laughs> I've never heard of Slovenia. In the, in the documentary, they even interview some of them, and they're speaking in broken English. Oh, yes, this is a good place, broken skull. But, so things began to change, and, and Mr. White knows that he has a very long history behind him, but he also hopes to pass to his next generation and to their children this legacy, as long as the broken spoke remains standing and uh, has the right family members to keep it going. Right, Mr. White? That's correct. You know, um, if anything happens to me, I mean, my, my wife, um, She's capable of doing it. She does everything anyway. She bartends and she waits tables. She trains, trains the waitress and uh, she also trains the cooks. And uh, that's her recipe for our chicken fried steak. Mm -hmm. And uh, she she can make gravy so easy. I mean, she, she can do it just no, no problem at all. And uh, she made gravy for a bunch of people up in Iowa, Dubuque, Iowa, when we took the movie up there recently. Uh, we took it to Dallas, we took it to Nashville, took it to Dubuque, Iowa, and ended up over there in uh, Amsterdam. But I, I didn't go to Amsterdam. My wife said, too darn cold for me, I ain't going. <laughs> but she didn't go, so I, I didn't want to go either. But anyway, uh, it's, uh, it's fun, uh, the movies, and I can't thank uh, the movie people enough for what they did. And same with Donna Marie, and uh, we've become real good friends. Uh, with all her family, and uh, it's been a very, it's been like three years. Uh, it took approximately three years for the movie and three years for the book, and they all kind of started about the same time, and then they all finished about the same time. But I mean, I, I never thought we'd ever have a, a movie about the spoke or a book. It just, uh, I wanted to open up a honky tonk. <laughs> and so <laughs> back there this month, September 25th, the day I got in the army, it'd be like 53 years ago, I was driving nails in that red musty coal building. And my helpers is all drinkers. <laughs> and it, and, but there was free help. But they were pretty good, pretty good drunks, really. And my roofers, my roofers literally fell off that roof. roof and and they, they got sick on me. But it, it's just something that happened. And, but they just kind of hang around. Anytime it's kind of like a mechanic when you raise your hood, all these shade tree mechanics they appear and you start destruction out there in South Lamar. Back in them days, all the people said, Oh hell, let, let me show you how to do this because they looked at me even after I opened up, they looked at me and they said, Well you don't know what the hell you're doing. I said you ain't gonna last six months. <laughs> and so, so then after about five years, the same guys that came by and they said, well, hell, you had everything going for you. No way that you could have missed, you know. <laughs> but I, I literally opened up, I mean, I had two cigar boxes. I didn't even have a cash register. And then I, later on, I got my first cash register. And then that one didn't even have a tape in it. And they told me that you're going to get in trouble in Internal Revenue if you don't get a tape in the register. So I got one with the tape on it. And now I went through about, I don't know, 15, 20 cash registers. I set front doors and it's just uh, it keeps on going. I kind of I band aid the broken spoke back together. 